Babies are born social creatures. From their earliest days, they begin to connect to and collect information from their caregivers. In fact, even newborns are capable of imitating facial expressions, demonstrating an understanding of how another's actions relate to their own. Within weeks, they are cooing and intentionally smiling, responding in rhythm to their caregivers' communications. In this lecture, we will look at emotional development, the development of social bonds, theories of infant psychosocial development, and providing care for babies in the first two years. The intimate dyad with the parent or primary caregiver is part of what researcher Eric Erickson calls the stage of basic trust versus mistrust. From zero to two, children are engaged in relationships, trying to develop a sense of being nurtured and loved. Comfort is key in early emotions. Infants are highly sensitive. Early emotions include high emotional responsiveness, pain, and pleasure. These are mainly responses to uh, physiological needs. They cry when they are hurt, hungry, tired, and frightened. Uh, they may also have colic, which is uncontrollable. It, it involves reflux and immature swallowing. It can be excessive. I recall my daughter who had colic. The pediatrician explained this was because her liver was not fully developed yet. This type of crying is excessive and it is very difficult to comfort the baby. Reactive pain and pleasure progresses to more complex social awareness. Sometimes a smile in the early weeks of life is simply a sign that your little bundle of joy is passing gas. But starting between six and eight weeks of life, babies develop a social smile, an intentional gesture of warmth meant just for you. Laughing can occur between three to four months. It often emerges as curiosity. The first expressions of anger occur around six months and anger is a healthy response at this point of life to frustration. Sadness indicates withdrawal and is accompanied by increased production of cortisol. Sadness is a very stressful experience for infants. Fear emerges at about nine months in response to people, things, or situations. Stranger wariness is where an infant no longer smiles at any friendly face, but cries or looks frightened when an unfamiliar person moves too close. Separation anxiety involves tears, dismay, or anger when a familiar caregiver leaves. If it remains strong after age three, it may be considered an emotional disorder. Both Santa's smile and Olivia's grimace here are appropriate reactions for people of their age. Adults playing Santa must smile no matter what. And if Olivia smiled, well, that would be troubling to anyone who knows about seven-month-olds. It makes you wonder why someone would scare this infant by putting her in the grip of an oddly dressed bearded stranger. As infants become toddlers, anger and fear become less frequent and more focused. Laughing and crying become louder and more discriminating, and temper tantrums may appear. Also, some new emotions emerge, pride, shame, embarrassment, disgust, and guilt. They require an awareness of other people, and they emerge from family interactions influenced by the culture. Self-awareness is a person's realization that he or she is a distinct individual whose body, mind, and actions are separate from those of other people. The neurobiological and psychological triggers for self-awareness have not yet been clarified. What we do know is that this occurs around one to three years. The child begins to know her own name and refer to herself by name. The child will begin to look in the mirror and realize she's looking at herself. She will also make clearer her own likes and dislikes, needs and wishes. There are other ways in which children give evidence of increased self-awareness. For instance, they now begin to use the pronouns, I, me, mine, to refer to themselves. They may begin to use proper names, including their own. They are also increasingly capable of empathic acts, demonstrating their increased sense of being an object who can be experienced by another. The Rouge test is a fascinating and classic experiment. Babies aged nine to 24 months looked into a mirror after a dot of rouge had been placed on their noses. 
15 to 24 month olds showed self-awareness by touching their own noses with curiosity. If they continued to touch their nose, it proves that they recognize themselves and they try to rub off the dot of rouge because it violates the infant's view of the self. The rouge test indicates that at 18 months, children develop a sense of self-recognition and understanding. Children who are younger than 15 months of age may try to wipe the color from the mirror, but a 15-month-old child may wipe the color from his or her own nose. Once a child has achieved self-awareness, the child is moving toward understanding social emotions such as guilt, shame, or embarrassment, as well as sympathy or empathy. Children are born with certain temperamental dispositions. Temperament is the biologically based core of individual differences in style of approach and response to the environment that is stable across time and situations. Their temperament guides how they approach the world and affects how people respond to them. Temperamental traits are genetic. Personality traits are learned. Some temperaments can be more challenging than others. Children with challenging temperaments have been described as orchid flowers. In unfavorable conditions, orchids wilt and wither. Yet with suitable loving care, orchids can bloom in a way that is unique and magnificent. In the same way, a child can thrive with supportive care. Parents adapt their behavior and environment to fit the child's temperament. That is, they create goodness of fit. Through sensitive parenting, a child learns to respond in new ways and improve self-regulation. Three dimensions of temperament are found. Effortful control, where the child can regulate attention and emotion and be self-soothing. Negative mood, the child is fearful, angry, unhappy. And exuberance, the child is active, social, and not shy. A dimension means a child can have more or less of a behavior. A tendency in one dimension does not determine a tendency on another dimension. By thinking of temperament as dimensions, we can help children find balance. For instance, if a child has high negative mood and reactivity, we can work on self-regulation or effortful control to help balance those negative emotions. A child's behavior within each dimension combines to create his or her unique temperament. Each dimension affects later personality and achievement and is associated with distinctive brain patterns and behaviors. Let's move on to the uh, topic of the development of social bonds. And first we'll discuss the phenomenon of synchrony, the coordinated rapid and smooth exchange of responses between a caregiver and an infant. Synchrony refers to how a parent's speech and infant's behavior become finally synchronized so that they are in direct response to one another. It was defined as a temporal coordination of micro level social behavior and as symbolic exchanges between parent and child. Psychologist Dr. Ruth Feldman suggests that interactional synchrony serves a critical role in developmental outcomes in terms of emotional self-regulation and the capacity for empathy. In this week's module, there are some videos with Dr. Feldman where she explains how the child's brain develops in relationship to the parent's brain and how these interaction patterns are carried out throughout life. These patterns are culture specific and help to incorporate the child into the social world. Synchrony in the first few months becomes more frequent and elaborate and it helps infants to learn to read others' emotions and to develop the skills of social interaction. It usually begins with parents imitating infants. Is synchrony needed for normal development? Well, we've gotten an answer from experiments using the still face technique. It's an experimental practice in which an adult keeps his or her face unmoving and expressionless in face-to-face -face interaction with an infant. The babies are very upset by the still face and show signs of stress. The conclusions of these experiments are that parents' responsiveness to an infant aids psychological and biological development, and infants' brains need social interaction to develop to their fullest. Studies that focus on child development show that there's a link between synchrony and attachment. The way our parents treat us in infancy lay the groundwork for our treatment of all relationships in the future. 
Attachment is a lasting emotional bond that one person has with another. It begins to form in early infancy and influences a person's close relationships throughout life. Infancy is a crucial time for brain development. It is vital that babies and their parents are supported during this time to promote attachment. Without a good initial bond, children are less likely to grow up to become happy, independent, and resilient adults. Parenting is therefore more important than we could have ever imagined. Four attachment types have been identified. The insecure avoidant attachment is where an infant avoids connection with the caregiver, as when the infant does not seem to care about the caregiver's presence, departure, or return. Secure attachment is described by an infant obtaining both comfort and confidence from the presence of his or her caregiver. With an insecure, resistant, ambivalent attachment, an infant's anxiety and uncertainty are evident as when the infant becomes very upset at separation from the caregiver and both resists and seeks contact on reunion. Disorganized attachment is a type of attachment that is marked by an infant's inconsistent reactions to the caregiver's departure and return. Now these attachment types are important because they become internalized models for future important relationships. Mary Ainsworth's strange situation is a laboratory procedure for measuring attachment by evoking infants' reactions to the stress of various adults' comings and goings in an unfamiliar playroom. Now the key observed behaviors in a, a securely attached infant when the, the mother leaves is the uh, exploration of the toys. The secure toddler plays happily. And the reaction to the caregiver's departure is characterized by a secure toddler just missing the caregiver. And the reaction to the caregiver's return, well, a secure toddler welcomes the caregiver's reappearance. We can also understand the development of social bonds through social referencing which is seeking emotional responses or information from other people and observing someone else's expressions and reactions and using the other person as a social reference. Infants look to parents for social referencing cues. Mothers use a variety of expressions, vocalizations, and gestures to convey social information to their infants. Synchrony, attachment, and social referencing are all apparent with fathers sometimes even more than with mothers. Social referencing has many practical applications. Babies may use social referencing for many things. For example, uh, she or he sees a shiny new object on the floor and is obviously intrigued by it. Or the infant sees you blowing bubbles and touching them. The infant looks at you to see if it's okay to touch the bubbles. Your smile or frown can act as referencing tools for your baby and uh, will determine if he or she proceeds to touch the object or avoid it. We're going to go back to Sigmund Freud to begin this part of the lecture on the theories of infant psychosocial development. Psychoanalytic theory identifies the oral and anal stages as occurring during the first two years. The oral stage in the first year is where the mouth is the young infant's primary source of gratification. The anal stage in the second year is where the infant's main pleasure comes from the anus. For example, the sensual pleasure of bowel movements and the psychological pleasure of controlling them. Some potential conflicts can occur. Oral fixation may occur if a mother frustrates her infant's urge to suck. The child may become an adult who is stuck or fixated at the oral stage. The adult may eat, drink, chew, bite, or talk excessively. An anal personality may develop. Overtly strict or premature toilet training may result in an adult with an unusually strong need for control, regularity, and cleanliness. Some of our keenest insights into psychosocial development come from a theory proposed by Eric Erickson. Infancy and the first two years are represented by the first two of his eight stages, trust versus mistrust, and autonomy versus shame and doubt. When a psychosocial crisis is not resolved, that aspect of psychosocial development is stunted, often limiting a person's ability to resolve future crises. In the trust versus mistrust stage, infants learn 
basic trust if the world is a secure place where their basic needs are met. In the autonomy versus shame and doubt stage, toddlers either succeed or fail in gaining a sense of self-rule over their actions and bodies. If there are early problems, an adult who is suspicious and pessimistic, mistrusting, or who is easily shamed, insufficient autonomy can be created. Behaviorism and Bandura's social learning theory provide us some additional perspectives on infant psychosocial development. Behaviorism asserts that parents mold an infant's emotions and personality through reinforcement and punishment. And Bandura emphasized that behavior patterns are acquired by observing the behavior of others. Gender roles in particular are learned. Because of the difficulties associated with testing infants, it has been challenging to determine when children first recognize their own or another's sex. Early studies suggested that labeling and understanding of gender may not emerge until about 30 months of age, but more recent studies have moved the age of understanding gender identity and labeling downward. In particular, behaviorism has looked at the effects of parenting. According to behaviorism, each action reinforces a lesson that the baby learns, in this case about people and objects, through proximal parenting and distal parenting. Proximal parenting is defined as caregiving practices that involve being physically close to the baby with frequent holding and touching. It may produce toddlers who are less self-aware, but more compliant. Distal parenting is defined as caregiving practices that involve remaining distant from the baby, providing toys, food, and face-to-face -face communication with minimal holding and touching. It may produce children who are self-aware, but less obedient. Notable cultural differences exist with newborns and older children. Culture is especially pivotal uh, for the proximal and distal responses. Cognitive theory presents yet another model or theory of infant psychosocial development. It purports that infants develop a working model, a set of assumptions that the individual uses to organize perceptions and experiences. These uh, working models formed in childhood echo lifelong. The child's interpretation of early experiences is more important than the actual experiences themselves and new working models can be developed based on new experiences or reinterpretation of previous experiences. A person might assume that other people are trustworthy and be surprised by evidence that this working model of human behavior is erroneous. And finally, evolutionary theory provides some insights into infant psychosocial development. A human child must be nourished, protected, and taught much longer than offspring from any other species. Infant and parent emotions ensure this lengthy protection. Evolutionary theory holds that the emotions of attachment, love, jealousy, even clinginess and anger keep toddlers near caregivers who remain vigilant. Allo care, the care of children by caregivers who are not their biological parents, is important. The last section of the chapter asks the question, who should care for babies? Nowadays, parents rely on daycare. High quality daycare during infancy has five essential characteristics. Number one, adequate attention to each infant. Infants need reliable, familiar, loving caregivers. Continuity of care is crucial. Two, encouragement of language and sensory motor development. Infants need language songs, conversations, and positive talk, and easily manipulated toys. Number three, attention to health and safety. Cleanliness routines, such as hand washing, uh, accident prevention, and safe areas to explore are essential. Number four, professional caregivers. Caregivers should have experience and degrees or certificates in early childhood education. Turnover should be low, morale high, and enthusiasm evident. Five, warm and responsive caregivers. Providers should engage the children in active play and guide them in problem solving. Quiet, obedient children may indicate unresponsive care. Who should care for babies? The conclusions are individualized care with stable caregivers seems best. Relationships are important. Each infant needs personal responsiveness. 
the instability of non-maternal care is problematic. Each infant needs an attentive, responsive caregiver who will be a base for secure attachment and a social reference so the infant can feel safe exploring the world. This allows the healthy development of emotions and experiences. 